In your book, Majesty of Reason, you talk about kind of tribalism and its impact on kind of belief formation. So how does tribalism impact belief formation and our engagement with dissenting perspectives? Good, good question. Yeah. So I guess what is tribalism? That's a good, that's a good first question. It is kind of what it sounds like. We as humans, as thinkers, as knowers, as participants in the kind of social epistemic sphere, we tend to form little tries. We tend to form little clusters of like-minded people where we agree with the people within that group to a disproportionately large extent, and we disagree and demonize people who are outside the group to a disproportionately large extent. So that's kind of like tribalism. It's really just forming these little groups and clusters and kind of unjustifiably putting down people who are outsiders and demonizing them and discounting their testimony, their evidence, their reasoning, their experience, and so on, while kind of heightening, unjustifiably, the evidence and testimony and experiences of people within your group, within your tribe, right? That's where the word tribalism comes from. It's these warring tribes that are kind of at ideological war with one another. So that's tribalism. And, and how does it affect our beliefs? Well, oh my goodness, it, it, affects, it affects us in so many different ways. We become more inclined to trust the sources cited by people within our own clan, within our own tribe. We become more inclined to discount the sources that are cited by people outside of our little clan, outside of our tribe. We become more inclined, unjustifiably so, to trust the testimony of people within our, our clan or our tribe. We become less inclined to trust the testimony of people outside of it. So it's almost like this death spiral where you can get caught up in certain beliefs, you get rigidified and calcified in beliefs that may very well be false and dangerous, but you get rigidified in them because they're continually reinforced by all your sources of information that you're trusting, though namely the ones within your tribe, and you're not exposed to the best kind of criticisms of those views. And so you become rigidified, calcified in your false beliefs, you become resistant to acquiring new true beliefs and so on, and it's just, yeah, it's this death spiral. And ultimately, tribalism on steroids is basically like cults, right? So it really does affect our evidence gathering practices, um, who we trust, what sources we trust, and that, of course, is going to affect our beliefs. So that's partly why I think it's important to kind of at least highlight these tribalistic tendencies within humans and try to push back on them and try to give us tools for, I guess, cultivating anti-tribalistic mindsets. Of course, it's probably not possible to totally get rid of that. Unfortunately, it's just a kind of built-in aspect of human nature. But we can at least try to take steps to mitigate it and at least increase awareness that we are so inclined. So that's a little bit of a rough sketch about what tribalism is and kind of like the project in the first part of the book. Yeah. It's it's really interesting. In in the book itself, you talk about kind of obviously the importance of critical thinking, right? That's that's where we kind of kick kick things off from. Um, we need to kind of begin to utilize and uh, I guess gain the ability to think critically, to think outside of our normal parameters, to begin to challenge ourselves. Um, and it's almost like um, you talk about kind of uh, inwardly directing oneself towards the teleus of truth, which I thought was quite a beautiful phrase. And I kind of guess. On that sort of theme, then, kind of, in what ways does critical thinking actually act as a counterforce uh, towards kind of tribalistic tendencies? Yes, I mean, I have a kind of broad conception of critical thinking where it doesn't just include the kind of skills and capacities that one cultivates and exercises when one discusses arguments and tries to analyze and assess underlying assumptions and when one tries to kind of just inquire into the truth. It does include that, but it doesn't only include that. I have this broader conception of critical thinking where it also includes these intellectual virtues. And I think as a foundation for that kind of like moral virtues as well, but maybe I wouldn't be inclined to include the moral virtues within critical thinking. But certainly the intellectual virtues, I think, are, are a huge part in being a critical thinker. So that's why I think... Um, the answer to your, to your question here is going to come in. It's the intellectual virtues that are part and parcel of critical thinking that are going to help mitigate these tribalistic tendencies, these biases that we have, and so on. And that'll really just kind of help us orient ourselves toward that telos of truth, as you said. So what are some of these intellectual virtues? Well, one of them is intellectual humility. And 
This involves kind of just recognizing the limitations of your knowledge, recognizing the limitations of your abilities, recognizing the limitations of your research, recognizing that there may very well be considerations of which you're unaware that nevertheless bear on the, the truth or plausibility of the views that you hold. So it kind of it kind of uh, tempers you nicely, right? You are properly attentive to your own weaknesses, your own limitations, and you're also properly attentive to your strengths, right? Intellectually humble people aren't just like self-flagellating, right? They, they don't think that they're just um, morons who can't understand or know anything. No, it's an appropriate sensitivity to their limitations and their strengths. And then they can kind of, the intellectually humble person can appropriately adjust their confidence and their beliefs and their actions in accordance with the extent to which they are supported by the relevant evidence and reasons and so on. So yeah, it's really just being attentive to, being sensitive to, and recognizing your limitations in your knowledge and your abilities, and also being properly sensitive to your strengths and weaknesses. And it's just like a willingness to say, I don't know, when you genuinely don't know, instead of just trying to come up with something off the cuff to uh, save face or to bolster your tribe and so on. So... That's intellectual humility. The next one is intellectual curiosity. So this is kind of like the fire behind the critical thinker, you know? It's, it's, it's intellectual curiosity, which is that spark which spurs them on to investigate things further and to really try to discover the truth of the matter rather than just settling for kind of comforting things that your tribe has always told you. The intellectually curious person is like, hold on a second. <laughs> I should be challenging these fundamental assumptions that my, me and the rest of my tribe is taking for granted. So that's the intellectually curious person. It's that flaming passion and interest that you have for discovering truths in greater breadth and depth. So there's also intellectual perseverance, which I talk about in the book. And whereas curiosity is kind of like that initial spark, intellectual perseverance takes you through. It, like, it basically carries you through even when it's difficult, when the going gets tough, when you could just fall back on those comforting things that you have relied on in your upbringing or uh, through your tribe and so on. Um, instead, it's, it's, it's a kind of um, committed rejection of intellectual laziness. And it's a commitment to really try to pursue these things in the requisite depth <laughs> to uh, actually have your beliefs appropriately sensitive to uh, the, the range of evidence and reasons bearing on them. So that's intellectual perseverance. It kind of is persistence in, in the path of discovery. There's also intellectual responsibility, which is kind of just like taking charge of your intellectual life and your pursuit of truth. Um, not always just deferring to other people and, and deferring to other members of your tribe, but really trying to seek things out for yourself as well. Of course, there is room for proper deference, right? Um, there are authorities and experts on matters. When you are not yourself an expert, it is good of epistemic practice to defer to the experts on that matter because they're just far more likely to get to the truth than you. But intellectual responsibility is kind of a matter of knowing when to defer and when not to defer. You know, when to take things into your own hands and take charge of your intellectual life and when to defer. And in fact, deferring is, is itself an element of taking charge of your intellectual life, right? That's a matter of you being responsible for proportioning your beliefs to the evidence available to you. And sometimes the best way to proportion your beliefs to the evidence available to you is indeed to defer to the experts and so on, as I just said. Of course, you don't just blindly follow them, right? You, again, this is, where, this is where it comes back to intellectual humility, right? These are all intertwined with one another. So, yeah, that's intellectual resp responsibility. And there are lots of others, of course, like open-mindedness, you know, um, being at least willing to consider alternative viewpoints and being able to recognize it you may very well be wrong. You can still hold views, of course, and you can still passionately defend them, right? But at least being able to recognize that you might still be wrong, right? And that kind of opens you up to potential criticisms, right? You're not going to be just blocked off. You don't think you're kind of dogmatically already having all the truths that there are to know. So I think once we reflect on all these things, you can kind of see how these are antidotes to a lot of our tribalistic tendencies, right? Um, you're not just deferring to people in your own tribe. You're really trying to seek out opposing viewpoints and evidence and so on. You're appropriately sensitive to the limitations of yourself and the members of your tribe and so on. And um, you really are loving truth rather than just things that your tribe happened to kind of glom onto. So all these things are kind of antidotes to tribalism. If you enjoyed this clip, then head on over to Locals to access the full conversation right now. Supporters can access the video version and everyone can access the audio only version of the conversation. I'll see you over there.